What's going on, football fans? It's me, J.R. Clark, back again with another Pound for Pound ATL Live. Joined, as always, by my co-host, Jonathan Holder. Jonathan, what's going on, brother? Man, it is an awesome day. Uh, closer and closer to the draft. Uh, got fallout coming tomorrow evening. Uh, man, it's it's a good time uh, to be a fan of a lot of different things right now. Yeah, yeah, it definitely is a good time to be a fan. It is a good time to... Um, entertainment is at an all time high for the first time in, in years. I actually found myself like paying attention to the fact that WrestleMania was this past weekend. Uh, so that was interesting. I kind of got caught up in the, uh, storyline that was, you know, Cody Rhodes, uh, defeating Roman Reigns. I don't, I don't, I didn't watch like all of it by any stretch of the imagination, but it's like they did a really good job of, uh, hitting a lot of nostalgic um, beats, you know, during that. Yeah. And which, you know, growing up watching wrestling, that was, um, that was entertaining. Uh, Spence's past, Chris asking me, uh, how was the camping? Spence's past weekend out on uh, West Point Lake, dude, that was awesome. That was exactly what I needed, you know, get away from everything, uh, sit outside and like, cook breakfast when it's like crisp cool air outside it was it was good stuff it was a real good real good recharge uh but it still amazes me i spent all weekend telling my daughter not to get in the lake and wouldn't you know it Mm -hmm. (laughs) i mean what what do you expect i look i expect as a father my daughter to listen to me but i also remember as a child Definitely not listening to my parents. So, <laughs> nope, nope. Uh, Willie Doc is concerned, Jonathan, that you are hatless. Uh, looks like you might have got a fresh haircut. I uh, did. I see that. Yeah, looking all. I need looking to get spiffy. Ready. Yeah, yeah. He's looking, looking slick, as they I would know. say. I had to, I had to, I had to like it was starting to poke out down here. Oh yeah, see, I got. The, I got the flyaways going on and all this yep. jazz. Like, yeah. I didn't, I didn't quite got that far yet because I keep like the sides, you know, trim. <laughs> but, uh, but I, I know exactly what you're talking about. It's like you put the hat on and it's like, <laughs> you're, you're, you're like a little, you're like a male mini version of Gidget. That's right. Just, just anyway, well, we got a handful of things to get into, so we might as well just get into it. So, all right, as I say, you know, I was out of pocket most of, most of the weekend, uh, wrapped up my Sunday evening by joining the uh, uh, One Time for the Fans podcast. Uh, they were gracious enough to uh, have me on, and, and that really got me primed and back into the, uh, you know, the flow of the football stuff. But um, we've had a handful of of new additions to the team in the past couple of days. At least that's the last time uh, we have talked. Seems like we have made a flurry of like depth signings, a flurry mm-hmm. of, um, you know, cover your butt kind of signings in a sense, uh, which could, we can infer some things and we will infer some things because that's what we do um, yeah. going into the draft. But let's start off with the first one being um, kind of out of nowhere, we signed uh, a cornerback from Arizona, Antonio Hamilton, um, 31 years old, played uh, the last few years in Arizona. Some, Excuse me, I'm going to try to get his uh, information pulled up here so that I sound like I know what I'm talking about. Antonio Hamilton. Let's see. Oh, oh, oh. There it was. Football cornerback. That's what he is. So he's what six foot one ninety five, standard size, you know, standard corner, nothing, you know, crazy Pro- there. Age kind of prototypical, right? Prototypical, 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 because English go. is my first and only <laughs> language. Okay, so thirty one years old. So on the older side, uh, adding you know to that to that uh, wide receiver room. Last three years in Arizona, um. Not like not a ton of like stats to speak of. Last this past year, though, I'll say this: he had uh, 
played 14 games or started nine games, played 14 and had 11 pass defenses. So pass deflections. So that's, that's a pretty good number. Um, but again, this doesn't preclude you from drafting a corner or what have you. No, uh, but I think personally, I think this, uh, probably, uh, if we only get the one pick in the first round, I think this probably, uh, Maybe means we don't look at cornerback first round. And that, that's the part that we, we're going to infer, right? Because yeah. not only we didn't just stop there. If you had had added just Antonio Hamilton mm-hmm. and left it at that, I might have been like, okay, they're kind of wanting to replace, uh, you know, Jeff Okuda in the sense of like a a veteran with you know a good amount of starting experience so on and so forth. Like maybe, you know, lesser talented version, but more experienced because he's been in the league longer, so on and so forth, all those kind of things, right? Yeah. Um, So that was my first thought. And then the next day, I think, let me get it pulled up. I want to I want to get this right. We officially so, signed him yesterday, but yeah, I, I remember it was an, about this a few days ago. Yeah, it was announced the day before. But then on the 8th, yesterday, we made another cornerback signing. And that was uh, a name that's a little more familiar. As soon as I saw it, I was like, oh, I recognize this name. And that was Kevin King. And that's, he's formerly of the Green Bay Packers. Um, now, here's a tie here. He has a tie to Jimmy Lake in Washington. You know, because Jimmy Lake coached him, you know, out there in Washington. Now, he's 28. Right. Well, and he also he also has a connection to Jerry Gray. Correct from his Green Bay days. Yeah. Okay, so right, Nick just Nick just said the the same thing. He says, you know, Nick King, Kevin King played for Gray and Lake. Right. So there's heavy familiarity, and in the NFL, if there's one thing I know, it's as much about who you know as it is about what you know. Um. So anyway. He sat out all of 2022 with like mental health concerns, I believe is what I read. Um, or, you know, like wanting to get his mind right and his body right. Right. He came back in uh, 22, but I don't even think he made it out of preseason and he um, like tore his something. I don't know. See, I had all this in my head and now I'm, I'm getting blank on it. And then he, and then he injured himself this this offseason, didn't he? No, it was last offseason. Last offseason, okay. Right, and I'm trying to remember what that injury was. Injury, let's see if I can get it pulled up. I bet your chat's going to pull it up before uh, before I will. Let's see, he sits out. Um, oh, he had tore his uh, Achilles tendon during an offseason workout at the beginning of 22. So, okay. uh so that's something else to consider, but he was a pretty decent corner. The, the, oh, it was, so it was 2022. He chose to sit out the season for personal reasons. Correct. Could've, and it was 23. Could have been, been COVID related. Could have been who knows what else related. Mm-hmm. Uh, he then missed 2023 due to the torn Achilles. Yeah. Uh, which is good. Cause that means that if he, if we're expecting him to do anything this year, then uh, having it, Depending on when it happened last offseason, uh, the earlier the better, obviously. That means that he'll probably be ready for the season. Right. And th- and that's the thing. It's like, so you take a guy who's familiar with both coaches, and but he's 28 years old, coming off of um, an Achilles tear. Mm-hmm. So it's, both of these signings are like low risk, potentially high reward. Yeah. Um, you know, Kevin King was a decent corner. Uh, I'm not going to say he was anything extremely spectacular um, because his last full season in Green Bay in 21, like he only played 10 games and only started six. So like he wasn't a full-time starter. The last time he was a full-time starter, you could say was uh, 2019 and 2020. 2020 he only played 11 games so 
you know, we'll see how it goes. I think the mix of those two do kind of point towards you may not be taking a corner in the first round. Like, you may want to come out of the draft with a corner, you know, uh, for maybe a potential um, – Chris says he's got more low lights on than highlights on YouTube. Oh, that's bad. Yeah. <laughs> but um, anyway, so that may like it may be tipping their hand a little bit in a, in a way that Terry Fontenot has yet to do so far, uh, which is something I'm finding extremely interesting myself. Um, so. But again, but again, like you said, these guys uh, most likely were looking at these guys as – now, I, I could see Antonio Hamilton if they were like, hey, we're going to go with Antonio, you know, assuming that he doesn't hurt himself or anything like that. Then I could see them going into the season with A.J. Terrell on one side, Antonio Hamilton on the other, and worrying about potentially finding his, like a, either a replacement for A.J. or an actual wide receiver too in like next year's draft or something like that. Right. Um, potentially. Right. And, and that's possible. And so now also, you know, Nick does bring up a good point, you know, camp bodies in a sense. Yes. But camp bodies tend to tend to get signed over the summer. Like before we get to camp, you know, kind of deal. The closer um, you get to camp, the guys that you end up signing there most of the time, that's just like, we just need people to play to, to practice against. Right, right. We just we just need reps so that we're not having to run our guys into the ground per se. Um, but that's kind of leans me towards what Fred's alluding to here uh, with with our first super chat of the day. Fred, we appreciate you greatly. Thank you, Mr. Says, uh, he says Turner is definitely the pick now. I don't know if I'm going to say definitely the pick, um, but it's starting to feel like the general consensus is Turner for the Atlanta Falcons. Like that's, you know, almost every like mock draft you look at, uh, it's either Turner or Quinion Mitchell, you know, or now maybe Terry on Arnold because he was at the facility today, according to his social media. Um, so that's something to consider. Daniel Flick had a tweet. Oh, let me try to get down to it. D T D T D. Where'd it go? Uh, it says uh, among the most frequently linked prospects to Atlanta in the pre-draft process, uh, some confirmed top visits. So these are the people that have been linked to us the most. And we finally gotten some top 30 visits out of them or, or they're scheduled at least. And that's Dallas Turner, Jared verse, Terry and Arnold and Quinion Mitchell. So those are definitely your first round targets. It feels like for Atlanta. That's either an edge or it's a corner. Yeah. And I think it's going to have a lot to do with uh, if we're able to drop down the board some. Uh, it's, it's really feeling like that's what this draft is is pushing towards. Yeah. Uh, I I don't feel there's any urge to move up. Now they could surprise us all and do that. But, uh, you know, I don't. It doesn't feel like there's an urge. the only, The only reason to move up, in my mind, is to is uh, if you're going to want to pick up one of the QBs, right? Um, right. And I don't think you're. You know, if a QB falls to you, like for some reason, if somehow Drake May falls to eight, you know, do you? You know. Yeah, we're looking at Dallas Turner. Yeah, we're looking at Jared Verse. Yeah, we're looking at maybe going back. But if if a guy with that kind of talent falls to you at eight, who most people think he probably needs to sit for at minimum a year. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, but in this case, you're talking about Kirk Cousins, so maybe he sits for two years, maybe even three years. Uh, you know, do you take that guy and be like, we're, we're going to hold on to him, whatever, and let him learn behind Kirk Cousins? Maybe. But at the end of the day, I don't think that's going to happen. I don't think he's going to fall. Uh, and if and so, it, it does feel more like we're going back instead of up uh, if we move at all. Yeah, that that's kind of where I'm at. As I as I do feel like if there's any movement, I think it's it's 
going backwards. I think somebody uh, may come up for one of the tackles that might still be available. Uh, if some, if one of the big three wide receivers are still sitting there at eight, I could see somebody potentially trying to move up for a Dunze or um, neighbors. If one of those is for some odd reason still sitting there, if I don't see anybody moving up for Brock Bowers per se, just, I think honestly, and I know it's going to sound bad because it is us, but I think so far with Kyle Pitts, the way that has turned out may actually continue to scare people from wanting to take a tight end that high and then giving up assets to get said tight end. And it's not just Pitts. I mean, um, um, Evan Ingram hasn't necessarily turned out to be a you know barn burner. Neither has um, OJ Howard, um, David and Joku. Like, there's a handful. Uh, the, the the best uh, now and Joku has kind of shown shown up. He showed He's up. He's starting to now. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, for sure. But but now uh, some of the better like young tight ends are not taken in the first round. They're taken in the second. Right. I mean, mean, when you had like how Sam Laporta, you know, showed up last year and he wasn't taken in the first round. So I don't see anybody moving up necessarily to get um, Brock Bowers. But in this draft, uh, like I said, if one of those tackles is sitting there, like, like you'll move for tackles, you'll move for quarterbacks, obviously, and you'll move for, um, like wide receivers. Edge. Oh yeah. Edge and wide receivers. Yeah. Like those are like some of the premium positions. And so with that being said, if, if one of those guys are still sitting there, I think you could see that kind of movement. But I think what you're seeing now with the Falcons is them going, okay, we're probably going to end up having to stick at eight. So, you know, what's our best option at eight? Is it, one of these corners? Is it one of these cornerbacks? Like, is it one of these edge guys? Like, which one is, is you know, the, the best value uh, for sitting at eight? Because I don't think, unfortunately, even the corners, you don't have a Sauce Gardner. You know, you don't have a Patrick Sertain. Like, you've got some good corners. Like, Terry Arnold's a good corner. Kool-Aid McKinstry's a good corner. Quinion Mitchell is a good corner, but they're not they're not a top ten, like a consensus top ten, so to speak. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that if uh if Bowers goes ahead of us, right? Like if Bowers goes in the uh somewhere in the top seven, um I think that pushes either neighbors or Odunze to eight. And I think if either one of those guys are there and you get stuck at eight, I say stuck like it's a bad thing. Mm-hmm. If you get stuck at eight and you can't move out of it, if we're just looking for best player available, you know, if if, if we're going to stay true to that, maybe we do, maybe we don't, who knows. But if we're going to stay true to that philosophy, then you're probably picking neighbors or Dunze over <laughs> – a Dallas Turner over a Jared verse over a lot to uh, just because in the overall scheme of things, those are the better talents. Yeah. Uh, I mean, or your number eight pick. You're, you're not wrong in that scenario. And, and Chris had a good uh, question or a good statement earlier. Let me see if I can get back up to it. Oh, here's one that I missed earlier. Uh, one time for the fan, I spoke about them earlier. They said, uh, he says, they said, good evening, uh, chat shout out major shout out to pound for pound that was a that was a fun show last night uh, if y'all haven't had a chance to go check that out i highly recommend it not just because i was on it um jack and and uh oh i'm blanking on the tj i'm bad with names y'all know i am anyway they, <laughs> they both were, were awesome to chat with last night so nice. i'm gonna definitely go check that out anyway uh, guys yeah that's right uh, it was where was it at? I saw the. Okay, yeah, it was Chris. He says, uh, "At what point did we finally lock in on Bijan? Because it feels like this year will go down to day up." Um, I want to say it was probably the week before. So that would be like 
starting maybe this week, maybe next week, probably, is when we really started to hear, you know, like the guys like Daniel Jeremiah, when when he puts out his final mock, he doesn't, his, his mocks are, to me, are the closest to being accurate. And the reason why I say that is because he does his mocks off of what he's hearing the league say. Yeah. Not necessarily like his opinion is his big board, like is his top fifty. That's his opinion, right? And the the mock draft is what he thinks is actually going. Right, like yeah, yeah. So like like his big board is his evaluation, and where he thinks these players fit. You know, as far as like just ranking talent, and then his mocks tend to be what he's hearing from the league itself. So. It was about, it was the last mock, which I think comes out either this week or next week, is when you got, you know, Drake London, you know, mocked to the Falcons, is when you started getting Bijan mocked to the Falcons, um, when we started getting Kyle Pitts mocked to the Falcons. So um, it'll be interesting because I do feel like this year is, like Chris says, is more, feels like it's coming down to day of. Um, like I don't think we have as good of a opinion, I guess you could say a good of a lock um, on. I, I mean, I do feel like it's, I feel like it's corner. I mean, um, I feel like it's edge. Yeah, logic tells me it's edge. Um, my logic, I guess you could say, tells me that it's that it's edge, and especially considering you still haven't resigned Bud Dupree, you still haven't resigned Calais Campbell. To me, those two guys feel like they would be willing to come back. Um, they haven't signed anywhere else either. So correct, correct. Um, but then you do go out and sign um, James Smith Williams, mm-hmm. who is a four or five year starter—not starter, but four or five year player from Washington, former seventh round pick, um, seven career sacks, two sixty. Two sixty four. What is it? Yeah, he's uh, he's uh, like six four, two sixty five. Which uh, when you look at uh, who's the coach there now, that's kind of not the typical defensive end for a Dan Quinn style defense. Correct. Uh, Correct. He likes him a little bit leaner, a little bit faster. Mm-hmm. Uh, not the you know the two sixty five and up guys. Right. Which is, I mean, so like we if if we're doing playing in the business of inferring. Right. Like, what does that say about what this regime is going like what this coaching staff wants? Because that's more in the line of a Bud Dupree. Um, so are they are they signing this guy figuring they can get the same kind of production out of him as they did out of Bud Dupree at, at a much cheaper price? Um, like phys- physical measurables. We're just talking height, weight. Arm length, hand size, all that stuff. Uh, this James Smith, and I'm not trying to comp him as this or what he will be as this, but he literally is like the spitting image of a Latu. Like, mm. same, you know, right around, you know, about the same height. I think Latu might be 6'3 instead of 6'4, uh, but he's 267, you know, 33 and a third uh, or 33 and a half or whatever uh, arm length. Was it nine and something uh, hand size? Like they literally just just from a, a physical measurement standpoint, they're literally is that guy. <laughs> you know? So that that part I hadn't put together. So that's that's interesting, you know, especially with the, you know, obviously the connection with uh, Jimmy Lake and Latu. Like, mm-hmm. are you are you trying to have that type of pass rusher? on the field all the time by, by all accounts. Um, James Smith Williams is a high motor guy. Mm-hmm. Um, his best year came last year when he started 14 games and in 14 games had three sacks with uh, five tackles for loss and 16 QB hits. Now that there was a really good cut up yes. of, him, of him earlier today Uh like he he wasn't always getting to the quarterback, but he he seemed to always be near the quarterback. He uh, was constantly in pursuit, didn't give up. Uh, he at least um, you know was making 
the quarterback either get rid of the ball, uh, you know, made if he wasn't getting rid of the ball quickly, then there was going to be problems. So that you know, he was getting you know into the backfield. Right. Um, but yeah, the the numbers, the the finish, the production wasn't quite there. So uh, as far as the sack numbers go. Hmm. And how let's see here. And he's only, he's only, I mean, he's 26 years old. He's only been in the league for what? This will be his fourth year, fourth slash fifth year. He came in the league in 2020. So uh, that'll be interesting to see what kind of, you know, contribution he has. Willie Doc has a good point. Says I think they're just signing good depth so that there's no major drop off with injuries. I think that's what it is right now. They're adding, you know, they, they spent the majority of free agent adding to the offensive side of the ball. Mm-hmm. I and mean, we've talked about that extensively. Um, now it seems like they, have you know, have turned their attention back to the, you know, to the defense and trying to shore some things up, um, you know, going into the draft. Maybe not having – I still can't act like they don't have a major need at edge. Um yeah, you may not necessarily have a major need anywhere else. You may be comfortable with DeMarco Hellum starting next to to Jesse Bates. You might be comfortable with, you know, now that Eddie Goldman might survive the Georgia Heat and actually, um, you know, put on a, a Falcons uniform this time. You know, you might feel better about your D-line, but, just man, you're still talking about, you know, Onyamata coming off ankle injury that he nursed throughout most of the second half of the season. Grady Jarrett coming off of, you know, an Achilles tear. Um, and like there, that's so those are your two starters coming back from, you know, an injury plague season, right? So, yeah, but, but here, here's what I will say what I am interested in seeing. Uh, don't really know. I can't, I'm not going to say anything about, uh, Malone because we just don't know what he, did. yeah, we just don't. Well, what, what we do know is we know that, uh, Arnold Epichetti, uh, last year, if we look at, uh, uh, his, um, uh, you know, if we look at like how many snaps he ran versus, uh, his production, like if you were to extrapolate out like what he did last year over, Say some of some of the other DNs or outside linebackers that played like nine hundred to a thousand snaps in a season. Mm-hmm. Uh, then you're looking at a guy that's in the 12, 13, 14 sack range. Um, and if so, if we can get him more snaps out there, um, then I think that production goes up. Yeah, I mean, um, he had what twelve QB hits, three tackles for loss to go along with his six sacks and that was a jump from two and a half sacks his his rookie year so you can definitely talk yourself in into him being an ascending player um uh, (laughs) uh sorry chris called me off guard because i've heard stories about georgia humidity let's not sell it short just yet no well yeah hey it can be rough that 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 humidity kick you in the teeth man oh Um, yeah but So yeah, I mean, but you're you're to me you're putting a good bit on, you know, Ebiketti, uh as an ascending player, right? Yeah, but yeah. I mean, it's his third season, you know. So it's not like he's a rookie that you're putting this on. This is a guy who's in his third season. Uh, he got more reps last year, I think, probably than he did his year than his rookie year. So he's moving up in that in that stat. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, he and even in, even in his rookie year, he wasn't getting the amount of snaps. But if you looked at his, uh, you know, finish rate, win rate, all those things, those numbers were up there with some of the better rookies uh, out of the class. Would so, you, uh, would you believe me if I told you that he actually had less snaps? Last less year? snaps last year, according to Pro Football Reference. So I would like to check that with somebody else, like maybe PFF or something. Um, but according to Pro Football Reference, he had 516 snaps uh, in 2022, and then in 2023 he had 384 snaps. So he was actually more productive on less snaps. So it'd be interesting. 
um, if that's actually true or not. Um, that would be interesting. Like uh, normally, it, felt, it felt like he did get more last year, but I, you know, I could, I could absolutely be wrong. <laughs> like I'm with Chris in those. Like I'm, Malone is a guy I'm hoping makes a comeback. You know, with the staff because yeah, as King points out here, you know, with this three four, I'm hoping we're going to be sending a lot more, you know, a lot of blitzes because I don't see the secondary covering for long. With that switch, then that's with you know Ebiketti. That this will make his third defense in his third year, like his third like defensive switch. So I don't know how much that. Hopefully, that doesn't stunt him, you know, too bad. Uh, Because sometimes that can be a a big hindrance. Let's see here. Trying to see if I can figure out snap counts for. Okay. Yeah. Anyway. So, new comment. Let's see. GA says, I think uh, making an edge, making the edge we draft uh, will contribute a lot this season. If we do end up drafting an edge, it's gonna, if, I don't see how we don't. And to me, it's got to be uh, in the first round. Somebody was talking about they've seen a lot of like uh, Big Beasley comparisons to Turner and I don't I don't agree there like Big Beasley in college was 235 you know Turner is like 245 so he's he trend he's trending to be a heavier and Turner wins with more than just finesse yeah you know where Vic Beasley was a wide nine which is what Clemson played he was that wide nine you know speedball so, um, and he, and he really excelled like, uh, in the, in the, stu- the twists and the stunts, right. like that's where he excelled at, where he could use his speed to outrun a guard, uh, to the middle of the, of the line. Right. And where, you know, Turner had, you know, 10 sacks was his best total. Vic Beasley had 13, which fought and then followed it up with nine. His, you know, last year or so. I don't know. I don't necessarily see it. I think a lot of people see um, Turner being like the more athletic, um, you know, edge guy, the more you know, like, like freaky athlete. And oh yeah, here in Atlanta, anytime you get the freaky athlete edge, we're automatically going to, you know, go back to Beasley because that's you know, yeah. Beasley's game but, was. Well, there, there's. Like when I look at Dallas Turner, I, I remember last year coming into the like as we got closer to the draft, we started to hear some of the same stuff that we're hearing about Dallas Turner. We started hearing a lot of the same stuff about Will Anderson. Right. Uh, yep. A lot of people were looking at Will Anderson and they're like, "Oh, but you know, he was on that great uh, uh, Alabama defense. Uh, you know, he this, that, and the other, blah blah blah." He goes to Houston and does nothing but look like a great rookie. Right. You know, so like at the end of the day, I I mean, I I know I've said it. I know you said it. I, I, there's been a lot of people on Twitter that have said it at the end of the day. If we come out of this first round, this first night with any one of Dallas Turner, Jared verse, uh, Latu, if we get any one of those three guys, we got us. We, we have a player. Hmm. Okay. Like, there's there you know what you know some of them do one thing maybe a little bit better than the others uh somehow are a little bit more athletic than the others but at the end of the day you know, Latu is a a technical marvel uh when it comes to the technique of pat rushing the passer uh jared verse is kind of the middle guy uh he's got some good technique but he needs to work on some things he's got some good athleticism but he's maybe a little bit bigger doesn't mm-hmm. quite have the the fluidity of Latu or um Turner. Uh, or, or Turner and then Dallas Turner like you said freak athlete absolutely measurables out the wazoo uh guy runs a crazy 40 uh has a good you know jump you know he jumps really good uh he's got the long arms he does you know he has a good bull rush he does have some good finesse moves he's got good counter moves but at the end of the day you know so they are all kind of doing their own little thing the best, in my opinion, the best all-around guy, 
to plug in day one and get good production out of, uh, you know, and, ex- and probably expect it would probably be Latu just because we've seen him drop back in coverage. We've seen him get two interceptions last year. We saw him get a boatload of sacks. Yes, he probably had some games uh, against some really good guys where he got beat, but that's going to happen. But I, yeah. I, this guy has also had a crazy injury. He's had to fight through uh, the rehab from that injury, get back on the football field, not just a, not just be a charity case, but get but prove that he can do it. Uh, and again, you hear, when you hear Raheem Morris talk about what he's you know like sort of like when he talked about some of the coaches, specifically Jimmy Lake. It's like this guy made it to the pinnacle, became a head coach in college football, and then you know fell down and has had to work his way back up. Like got, hitting that that adversity, getting mm. knocked down by it, getting back up and, and continuing on and being successful, he values that. Of the three guys that we've seen uh, or that we're talking about, the one guy that has kind of gone through that is Latu. Guy had a mm. crazy injury, could have potentially ended his playing career for the for the rest of his life, uh, but he came back, got cleared, had to work his way back into it. And was success- and extremely successful coming back from that adversity. So yeah. when you when you look at that, that's in my brain. That's why I'm thinking, if nothing else, you know, when you hear you may never play again, uh, and if you do, you could seriously hurt yourself. But you still do it anyways. To me, that shows tenacity, and it shows uh, you know maybe some level of recklessness, but also a guy who loves the game and really wants to play the game could not see himself doing anything other than playing the game of football and that passion along with the, you know, working through the adversity and everything in my brain, that makes me think this is the guy for he more his team. Right. Love to have. Yeah, no doubt. My, my only concern with Latu and, and verse to an extent, and I could be wrong. I mean, heck, the, like we won't know until they get in the league, but if you're looking at and, and thinking of just a, um, a, a ta- talent evaluation standpoint, mm-hmm. you know, part of what you're trying to see is like, you're trying to project what, the, what can these guys become? Like how much meat is left on the bone as far as, you know, development goes, um, you know, can we, can they be a better version of themselves or are they tapped out? And I'm not, I'm not sitting here trying to say that I'm the most uh, keen evaluator. Uh, Cause I'm definitely not. You know, if I was, we, we, I'd be doing something different than this per se, or I'd be doing it on a bigger platform. But, uh, it, it does seem like I've heard a lot of people say a lot of folks that I trust that like, like guys like Latu and guys like verse might be more tapped out as far as potential than a guy like Turner. And if you're going to spend a first round draft asset, I've always viewed, first round picks as you know i'm taking a swing at the hall of fame here like i'm you know whether i'm right or wrong i'm saying that i feel like this guy is going to be good enough to be in the hall of fame obviously the vast majority of them aren't that's not how it works out but to me that's what you're saying with a first round pick you know you're looking for a franchise cornerstone and I guess maybe I'm probably letting it stick in my head too much, but uh, I heard somebody make the the comparison with Latu and Leighton Vander Esch. And Vander Esch was a guy I really liked coming out of college. Linebacker, loved the way he played. He played with his freaking hair on fire. Thought it was awesome. Had a crazy neck injury. And then, like, basically he was only able to play five years in the league. And, you know, for those five years, it, it was up and down. You know, as far well, as like, it was, it was, well, it was up and down because he kept getting injured. That's what I'm saying. Uh, and like so, when he was when he was in, he was really good. But yeah, right. I, I mm-hmm. totally get that. Too. And so maybe I'm letting that probably like scare me a little bit too much with Latu, because before that evaluator made that connection, I was like, yeah, Latu is a good, you know, like the dude, so to speak, uh, because of, um you know, the, the hand fighting that he has and the um, ability to win in a, in a handful of different ways. I think um, Chris 
said, you know, based on like solely on win rates, I want both of the UCLA guys. And we're going to get into that here as we wrap up the show. But yeah, like watching Latu, both those guys, you know, popped off to me. And um, so, hold on. Yep. Uh, yes. And so, uh, yeah, we're going to start to wrap it up. Let's get to this right here. Willie Doc, we appreciate you greatly uh, with your your $5. Tip. Are oh, you going to, yep. you know, I'm about to say, are you going to cut me I off just, with the da 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 Nope. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Willie Doc. That's it. He says, wild two-part question. Uh, what is the lowest lot two will go in this draft? And do you think the Falcons take verse slash Turner and then trade back up to get lot two? Okay, I don't see the latter part happening. I could be completely wrong on that one. Uh, under a different regime, we have double dipped before um, with uh, Trufant and then uh, Alford, but that was first round, second round. Um, I don't know if he would come back up. And the far, I don't think Latu makes it out of the twenties. To be completely honest, I mean, um, I think the absolute, I think the absolute lowest is. Probably going to be in the low, like the, the early 20s, like 21, 22 at worst. Uh, he may not even make it to the 20s. Because it wouldn't surprise me one bit. And I'm trying to see, I'm, I'm trying to get it pulled up now so that I know where now, we're at. Now, I, I will say, I will say, if see, if he somehow were to fall to the second round and the Falcons had a chance to pick him in the second round and they did, I would love that because. Not only is this a guy that has gone through that adversity, made it back, but now he's got a chip on his shoulder because he was supposed to be a number one draft pick. You pick him in the second, he's going to be like, I'm going to make everyone understand that that was a huge mistake. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, Willie, you're not wrong. We did double dip for Lindstrom and McGarry when we came back up to get McGarry um, at the top, at the back end of the first round. But again, that was Dimitrov. Um, so... I don't, and that was Dimitrov with McKay calling the shots as everybody, you know, you no longer have that scenario. Um, so who's to say? I don't think Latu falls past, honestly, past like Baltimore at 30. Like, uh, they're not scared of taking, you know, uh, edge rushers with, you know, injury history. They, uh, they took, uh, David Obo or uh, Adobo or Obo from Michigan a couple years back. Uh, so I, I couldn't see him falling past that. Definitely couldn't see him falling past like the Cardinals. They need everything um, yep. as far as that goes. Uh, same thing with, yeah, I can, yeah, definitely could see that. Not, not much, much further than the twenties, really like the, the full range of the twenties. Let's see. King says, well, let's say this uh, to have no top edge on our team uh, to learn from Latu is the best pick with his skill set all around. Uh, remember, a lot of our young guys have no one in that position to learn from. So you're talking about like like no like veteran leadership. Now, I still it wouldn't surprise me that if after the draft they brought back Calais Campbell because uh, it seems like there might be some like mutual interest there. But uh, uh, it wouldn't surprise me one bit. It, it wouldn't surprise me if we brought back him and or Bud Dupree. Either right, one. along with the first round uh, pick. All right, let's get into our at least a little bit of this before we have to wrap up because we got to wrap up right at eight tonight. Um, All right. So we got about 15 more minutes that we can at least get through some of these. This will probably be the back end of our uh, show for the next few weeks, uh, the best of the rest. And so, Jonathan, you want to kick off who who your best of the rest is? So we, we've we talked about Dallas uh, Turner. We've talked about Verse. We've talked about Latu. Um, another guy, you know, I could have gone with maybe like a Chop Robinson or something like that. But I'm going to go with Marshawn Nealon. There you go. The guy to look at, uh, you know, just from some of the film that I looked at him, uh, really powerful rusher. Uh, uses his hands well uh, in my eyes, like when I watched him. Um, he, uh, I saw him multiple times working out at both a two-point and three-point stance. I saw him 
moving up and down, you know, uh, all around the line, uh, rushing from different angles, from different positions, through different gaps, mm. uh, you know, uh, you know, and then, you know, saw him, I actually saw him drop back in coverage and make some plays and uh, seemed to be a good tackler. Uh, you know, this is a guy that, uh, you know, when you look at his, again, I think when you look at his uh, just physical measurables, he's kind of in line with a lot to, he's kind of in line with uh, the, the guy we just signed today uh, or signed the other day, Smith Williams. Mm-hmm. Like he is in that mold. But he's definitely a guy that I could see if you're, you know, we were talking about double dipping earlier. Uh, I don't necessarily see like getting a Turner or verse and then coming back up and getting a lot to, I could see them doing Turner verse law to whatever. And then and say the second, maybe the third round. Uh, Cause I think that's where he lands is like later the second, maybe early third, somewhere in that range. Uh, I think uh, if you do that and then pick up a Marshawn Neyland, I think that's uh, definitely uh, a potential thing there. Um, but yeah, he's, uh, you know, he's just a guy that, like, when I looked at the film, I was like, man, this guy looks real good. Um, right. So, if any of y'all are familiar with uh, the relative athletic score or the RAS score, um, this is, and, and I'm going to go ahead and like piggyback off yours. My, my, um, you know, best of the rest is, Latu's running partner, which yep. is, you know, Gabriel Murphy. And so here's a side-by-side like comparison of, of their, their athletic scores. So both of them have an overall pretty high athletic score, which is, is a metric, not the metric. Right. Yeah. Uh, so it just gives us something to point at and to look at. Right. So yep. Neilan is, you know, six, three, two sixty seven. So that's that's in that that James Smith Williams uh law to now Gabriel is a little leaner in that Dallas Murphy type area at, at 247 and 62 um but they both bench you know he 25 reps 21 reps um 40 yard dash 4746 hold on hold on one second uh, the, I think that, so you see the, the bench press 25, 21, we see that, uh, neyland has got the longer arms at 34 and a half versus 30 and a half for Correct. Gabriel Murphy. So mm-hmm. that's probably, uh, you know, one thing that will make it easier for Murphy to get those extra four reps up. No doubt. And also this is something that you would kneel in. You got to remember that 34 inch arms, like that's, that's, yeah, well that's, that's in what they have wanted to like draft. I'd be interested to see. I wonder if it'll let me do this. I don't know what their database looks like. If I could spell, I'd be deadly. Uh, yeah, there you go. Yeah, I figured it was close enough. I've had to I've had to spell it a couple times now. So, so let's see what. Okay, there we go. So, see, thirty-four. Yeah. For Arnold Evagetti, thirty-four. So that's a. Uh, uh, a good indicator of what they, you know, what they like. Same. And, yeah, and you the see, they press. both, yep. yeah, they bench press both have the 34 inch arms. Mm-hmm. So yeah. now here's a little difference there in the, like the 20 yard splits and the, yeah. but even though his 10 yard split, they're like, he's a little faster on the 10 yard split. Yeah. So like, he's actually pretty comparable to Arnold Abiquetti. Yep. Um, so that can be interesting there. But yeah, both of those guys, like when I was watching Latu early on, like Gabriel Murphy jumped off as as somebody they they had a really interesting I made the tweet one point in time. Do you know, did UCLA even have a defensive tackle? Uh because like they had Latu and Gabriel lined up like over the guards a lot of the times. Um, yep. which I found to be an interesting use of their um of their talents. But the one problem I had, I didn't realize with, with Marshawn, like he never, he never got more than four and a half sacks at Western Michigan in a year. Yeah. And, and I thought that, I, I don't know, for some reason I was, I was expecting more. Well, that's, that's the reason why I wouldn't take him in the first. I, you of know, course if, I was, yeah, yeah. if I, if I was going to double dip on him, 
Uh, you know, I'm going to be double dipping in like, uh, you know, like I said, late second, maybe early third. If you can wait a little bit longer and still get him, maybe midway through the third, I'd take him there too. Right. So now with Gabriel Murphy, he started out at North Texas, um, in 2021. So he's a, he's a five-year player, another older, you know, older player. (coughs) And then he transferred to UCLA. And really was able to put on put on a show last last year this past season with sixteen tackles for loss and eight eight sacks. So that that's pretty good production um, yeah. uh, from him. <clears throat> was there another one that you wanted to hit real quick before we start uh, wrapping this thing up? Yeah. So the other guy. Uh, so we kind of talked about what seeming at least what we believe to be kind of the leading contenders for. Who we would want to, or who who we believe will be the pick, uh, if it's not an edge, the other side of it is uh, cornerback, and obviously you know the Terry on Arnold's, um, and uh, you know uh, Ken Street and all those guys. Another guy that uh, you know when I looked at the film uh, for him, he just he really popped for me was T.J. Tampa. Mm-hmm. Um, Uh, yeah, TJ Tampa, uh, when I watched him, strong tackler. Like, every time I saw him tackling a guy, it seemed like there was always bad intentions in the team. Mm-hmm. You know, it wasn't uh, just, I'm going to shoestring this guy. No, he was knocking some fools out. Uh, <laughs> so I really I really liked uh, what I saw there. Uh, and that goes with the – he's just a physical player. He, he you know, wasn't uh, – didn't shy away from, uh, you know uh, – from, from just like getting up and bumping guys or, you know, getting in guys hit pockets. Like he was, he, he was very physical from what I saw. Uh, he has a uh, good length. Uh, yeah, he's 60, a, like, 190. Yeah. Yeah. Good length and size. Uh, good speed. Uh, ran a four, four, five, uh, 40. So, uh, and the other thing that I thought I really liked seeing with him was he played the run Right. Uh, he did, again. He, he didn't shy away from uh, the contact and shy away from tackling, and got in there and mixed it up really well when it came to the run game. Uh, it seemed to, to to play his fit, you know, like really well too. He wasn't, you know, just a wild man out there, uh, you know, going off half cock. So right. This kind of goes within what Charleston Nash was asking. It says, "Do you think there's a possibility that Raheem Morris and company could find a, a cornerback that they would like to groom?" And turn the secondary from uh, good to one step closer to elite, and I think this might, you know, TJ Tampa is sounds like a guy who could fit that mold, and I could definitely see this staff wanting to like grab some guys to groom, you know, into the into, I mean, because you've got some crazy like secondary coaches, you know, yep. with I mean, Raheem, Jimmy Lake, and Jerry Gray. That's all. That's their whole background is you know, defensive backs. And so I could definitely see them not want, not shying away with the idea of grooming a guy. Like, yeah, absolutely. They, you know, may not, they may have a mindset of, we don't have to have a guy in the first round because, yeah. you know, we we can make some guys uh, into some, into some dogs, you know? Yeah. I mean, and they can flip it on its head and, and go, like you said, Terry on Arnold, Quinn on Mitchell, one of those guys that they trade back maybe to 11, 12, 13, somewhere in that range. And if they trade back there, maybe instead of the defensive end, maybe they go with uh, one of those high end cornerbacks, uh, the higher end quarterbacks. And then in like the second round, you go with like, say a chop Robinson or, you know, Gabriel Murphy or somebody like that as you're kind of the, the big defensive end guy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. And then and then you top all this off with Tavondre Sweat being a, a really just bell end here and getting a DWI uh, a couple weeks before the draft. Uh, you know, maybe he turns into the this is this is his uh, you know weed gas mask gas mask ball. <laughs> <laughs> you know? I don't know. Um, you know, Charleston follows it up. Is there anyone in the draft whose ethos sticks out to y'all? Um. What is ethos? Yeah, that's what I'm sitting here trying to think. It's like, man, so I'm gonna say. Uh, I don't want to sound like a, a dummy. No, no, I, I was gonna. I, I, I was hoping you were uh, gonna be able to tell me what that was. Uh, ethos, me. Okay, Charleston's over here using some like ten dollar words. 
Uh, oh. Distinguishing character, sentiment, moral nature, or guiding beliefs of a person. All right, so I'm gonna say football ethos, like what style ma- matches. I think uh, you know Quinion Mitchell. I saw a chart that seems to like rely, like relay that he does like a lot of. He played a lot of the way Jimmy Lake and them like to deploy corners so if you're looking for somebody who fits in a football ethos um i would say you know quinion mitchell i would say a dallas turner um because of being able to run the creepers and the um you know simulated pressures and stuff like that um He's over here making it. <laughs> we, ain't, we ain't trying to groom folks that way, Michael. Okay. It, Calm down. Get it right. It's the diddler. Come on. The diddler. <laughs> All right, folks. <laughs> Sorry to have to cut this one short tonight, but I got a wife who's not feeling too good, and I've got to go um, put my, you know, get my, do, do the whole bedtime routine with my daughter. So I appreciate y'all hanging with us. Uh, next week, we will, next week or maybe even this Friday, Maybe we can get back into a normal, like recording something for the weekend uh, now with the holidays and camping past. So we'll see how that goes. Thank you, Nick. Mom, yeah, you know, she will. She went to, it's just a sinus infection, but you know, that, that takes, takes time and rest to get that stuff knocked out. So yeah, uh, we appreciate y'all as always hanging out with us. Um, yeah. Well, like I said, we'll try to be back Friday, maybe doing some more, uh, best of the rest type stuff yeah, and and get ready for the the eight out you know oh good four, yeah. or five, four or five hours six hour stream for uh night one of the draft in a couple weeks and that's yeah. it and for those of you all who who celebrate uh tomorrow the beast from dan bugler drops on the athletic so uh that's a good that's a really good draft primer uh that nice. i can't wait to dive into all right folks we appreciate y'all. As always, you can follow me on Twitter. I'm at Grim1128, G-R-I-M-M-1128. Jonathan. Uh, at Jonathan M. Holder. Just come on by and say hi. That's right. Chris says, uh, with another, like, uh, says, see y'all next week. Enjoy the 500 mock draft. That's right. We'll make it 500 in one. So, right, so, so, yeah, next week we'll definitely do a mock draft. Oh, yeah, for sure, for sure. All right. Peace. Rise up. Rise up.